One of the things, we talked a little bit about the difference between this franchise model versus independent club model. Um, and the perspective of you know, that franchise model closed system, how it doesn't afford a lot of different opportunities. Now we only really discussed it in terms of what that means for pro rep. Closed, you got a franchise, you're in a protected space, you can go and rebuild every year that you want, like the Chicago Cubs, totally fine. No problem with it. What are the other th other uh, elements to uh, being an independent club that you feel are beneficial that should be injected into the American soccer system? Because you alluded to a couple before, let's dive into that a little bit. Okay. Uh, the first thing I think is an independent club reflects the culture of the community that they're in. And that community can be part of a large ci city, but it's a community within that uh, large city. Um, a, a great example is are the Maryland Bobcats. They created a culture as an amateur club that was centric to their community and what they were all about. They won UPSL and then moved, uh, played in our independent cup and then moved up to the pro. Now you look at them this year and they're performing well, really well on the pitch. They've really adjusted over the last two years but they still represent the community they're in. Um, I think another aspect of this is the IP rights, right? Maryland Bobcats own their own IP rights, which is hugely important. If you're gonna spend millions of dollars over the course of years to develop your club and your brand, you should own that brand, right? And I'll use an example. Would the Bavarians in Milwaukee, which has been around for over 100 years, give up their brand to join a closed system? The answer is hell no, right? Keep your brand, right? Maintain and spend money on your brand. And instead of buying a franchise and protected territory, take that money and spend it in the community. Make your community better than it is today. So there are a number of things player movement, solidarity payments, all strong belief um, um, pillars of the independent system. And so we believe that independent clubs need a place to play and it should be in an independent You, you mentioned solidarity payments earlier mm -hmm. about being able to start and, and knowing that in the last uh, season or so, there have been a few NISA clubs that have, have put, those, put those forwards. And, and you know, as a definition for everyone, it's the idea of the transaction fee, but it's about going to amateur clubs where you find great talent and you bring them in versus just pimping them from that club. Correct, and, and to date, I think NISA has spent tens of thousands of dollars uh, to amateur clubs, and in some cases, that takes care of their league dues, right, for their entire season, uh, some of the payments that have gone back. But I think this goes to the larger question of independent clubs versus franchise. I think investment is a big difference between the two. So in a franchise model, uh, you pay for tens, millions of dollars for a franchise, for a protected bubble that you referenced. I want those investment dollars into the club. I just want them to be building soccer fields for the youth programs in the community. I want them to be spent on marketing dollars to pack the stadium. I want them to be engaged into the community and spent locally here at NISA, we live in a small community in Holland. I don't need the tens of millions of dollars sent to me for me to spend in my own community. Those dollars should be spent in their community. And that's really 
where the dollars should go. If we want to build this this soccer community or build this soccer landscape in this country, it needs to be spent on the grassroots efforts. And the other massive difference between the independent clubs and the franchise models is governance. Governance not only over your IP rights that you discussed earlier, but governance over the league itself. Um, we have control mechanisms that the league office has certain rights and the board of governors has some. But important to that foundation of Whistle and to NISA is that the clubs themselves can self-govern to some capacity. A franchise model, the franchisor has all the rights. They determine what happens. They may get input, but they are not bound by any input that they get from the, the franchises. So I think it's an important for, for self-determination, self-destiny of a particular club to maintain their IP rights and to maintain a voice at the table when major decisions are happening. Is that risk reward? I mean, what's the risk reward there? Because you do give a little bit more, more leash to the clubs to be able to do their thing. It's a little harder in some aspects to get them to participate. We've seen that uh, on, you know, on the NISA side before, mm -hmm. like getting them, hey, let's, let's make sure you're a part of this. So, but it's, is it, the, is it the, the better of two options is what's in the uh, end? I still believe it. You know, sometimes the, the right thing to do is not the easiest thing to do. Those, that happens in life all the time. And so we, we govern ourselves, our, our northern star is the open system is our principles. Um, we let that guide us and, and we hope at the league office and we hope that the, the well-being of the clubs that they check at some points in the process, they check their self-interest and put the greater interest of the game and of the league itself in front. Steve, real quick, just a comment on that. Um, we look at the open system and what we're creating at Nissan and Whistle as a democracy. And democracies are messy. And so our job in the league office is really difficult at times because of that. Um, but that means at the end of the day, when you do win at the end of the day, everyone's bought in and now you start moving forward in that direction. Um, it does make life interesting to say the least. Well, I mean, I was curious, I mean, Alex, to bring you into this, uh, I, I'm sure independent status versus franchise status might feed into your type A personality a little bit more, you get to a little bit more leeway. And, my, my, my wife would argue that she's type A and I, I don't even <laughs> exist. But um, here's something interesting that I've experienced in the U.S. soccer space. And one of the main reasons independent clubs are so appealing to me is the autonomy. So uh, starting FC Baltimore in 2018, we've had a number of players come through. And for myself, certainly one of my biggest focal points of coaching is to help a player become the best version of themselves. So we've had these players come through FC Baltimore. A number have gone on to MLS. One of them has actually been the no number one pick in the MLS draft. So one of the big decision matrices for a player when they get into that position is, do I join the MLS? Do I take this GA pick? Do I become the, the big man? And what does that look like? Now, what it actually looks like, and very few people realize, is you're going to be signing away four, maybe five years of your professional career where you are, let's just use the word for what it is. You are stuck. If, if the MLS does not want to release you to Europe, you are not going to Europe. Period. So what I love about Gold Star and what I love about our vision and our model is the entire purpose we exist is to facilitate the transfer of talented players to Europe, to the biggest stage in the world. So that's why we bought a club at Andorra. That's why we have created a pathway systemically that will enable players to know that when they want to go, they go. We have given players contracts that in writing, forget words, in writing, give them the freedom to move whenever they would like. And it is central to our entire identity. If we were an MLS club, there is absolutely no way that we could even do what we're doing. Does anyone else have that, like this model that, that they've got where you have an international club Anyone else that you know? Uh, it's, it's becoming more common within MISA, and the multi-club strategy worldwide is becoming very mm -hmm. popular. Um, I, I, I'm not sure that there are any MLS owners that own clubs overseas. Alex may know, Josh may know better. It's a different model, though. I yeah. mean, so I think the only true comparison of the multi-club strategy is not one that has an ownership group that owns an MLS franchise and a club overseas. I think it has to be club to club if it's multi-club, because 
um, because the IP rights and all the things that we talked about, player movement, etc. We do have another club. Uh, Savannah has a professional team in South Africa. So I think one of the, the, the attractions that NISA brings to the international investor or the international soccer fan is to invest in this country, which a lot of foreign money wants to do in the game of soccer because they see that as a huge growth opportunity with the 2026 World Cup coming. But what model are they going to invest in? A closed model that is foreign to them, literally foreign to them, or an open system uh, where they get to maintain their IP rights, move these players to and fro, and and I think it's I think we're going to see a lot more of that within NISA. Um, so I think this is a huge growth initiative for NISA as, as organizations come into our league. Is it? Do you see this as a benefit for, for as you're trying to grow the women's side? I think it's crucial, actually, and I think it's actually the foundation of Whistle in many ways because we absolutely see ourselves as a bridge. There is an open lane in the women's game, and it's the the, the lane between college and Division One or whatever higher aspirations a player may have. So there is a thousand NCAA Division One, Two, II, and Three women's programs in this country. College has not necessarily been the developmental level for men in the same way, but it is the developmental level for women in many ways. So from our perspective, the very fact that women could be coming up to their through whistle to aspire to win WSL, to international, uh, we see that as what we have to offer the players, and it is only in an open system that that could work. So we're, we require that, but we also, I think, again, we were able to put some as a new league and saying from the beginning yes. we are an independent, you know, open model that we've been able to put some bumpers around governance only in the sense as we began from a cultural perspective. And every new potential owner has to sort of buy into that cultural belief system. And if they don't, they're not going to fit, they're not going to be happy. And so when we look at future governance, we need to always know that the ownerships that we're talking to come in with sort of the, a, a right attitude from our perspective. It, and that allows the entire system to grow. Actually, I was going to ask you about it when it comes to the, uh, the right attitude. In general, in general, you, you said earlier that we usually eat our young and we're crushing each other in this, <laughs> in this sport. <laughs> Um, that came out the, That's all right. The idea is <laughs> true. It's, it's, it's so true. true. It's, so true. It's, yeah, it's not so far away. It's, but, the, but the idea of um, taking that idea, taking this idea of like what's the risk reward of having, giving too much leeway, um, is it the fact that if somebody's in the independent model, they are likely going to already have a mindset that is let's work together because we're all independent. We want to see independence work versus being too mavericky and saying, I like the independent because I can flout any, any rules or regulations. Yeah. I mean, what are you seeing? Both. <laughs> I mean, you said democracy is hard. That's why it's, every club is autonomous. They have their different opinions of how the world should be run. So again, it takes a strong league office in order to manage those, um, those egos, those expectations and the, the, divergent, in some cases, uh, strategies. So um, it's difficult, we want them all. Um, I, I think there's beauty in the differences of, of all our clubs and their personalities, whether it's on social media or, or in the boardroom. Um, there is some beauty there, and I think if we do our job correctly as a league office, um, just like US Soccer, if they do their job correctly as a federation, um, I think good things can come out of the consensus building amongst divergent viewpoints. Is it? more difficult as you're trying to grow these clubs mm -hmm. and sometimes moving them from the, the amateur side to the professional side, like Savannah uh, Clovers, FC, um, moving them from the amateur side to the professional side, or when you're bringing in uh, Gold Star FC Detroit, which is a brand new club, but getting them in and ready for a professional environment. Um, what's that mean from the vetting perspective to really know that they understand what they're looking for, what you're looking for, what they're going to get out of it, how that how that's going to fit, and if they can, oh, let's say, yeah, can they survive? How does that how does that impact? Yeah, yeah. because you don't so, you can't you can only ask for so much from the independent side franchise. You've got a lot more availability of yeah, information. You know, I, I think um, um, at NISA we've had some very big successes and we've had some losses. Right, um, some of the losses have to do with. Um, the club not being ready, 
right? And us not fully understanding uh, the club owner's perspective or motivation, right? And whether or not they were truly, you know, I like to use the term, uh, the will to survive, right? Because the first couple of years in professional soccer in this country, you have to have the, it's more than money. You have to have the will to survive. If you don't, it's too easy to pull the plug. And so I think we've learned a lot. That doesn't mean we won't make mistakes in the future. We will, because it's inevitable with independent clubs. So because, and, but I would also say that um, the beauty of those independent clubs is that from time to time, you really get surprised. And we are trying to do a better job in the legal office of onboarding to make sure that our clubs do get ready for that opening day. And, and you can tell that the, the clubs that have really done a good job of that um, and, and take it to heart do have some shorter term success than other clubs. I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a challenge that all of our clubs have, right? How do you go from being a brand new, even a brand new club, or from amateur where you get 50 or 60 or 100 people in a game, or 300 in a game, to, to 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 people in the game. It's a challenge, it's a huge challenge. I think that when we are talking about that vetting side and being able to understand and, and do both sides understand what they're getting into uh, and that they've got more autonomy and they actually have more, a little bit more responsibility as well mm -hmm. um, from that, um, that it probably takes, I would like to think, takes a little bit longer thought on their side about how ready they are. From your perspective, Alex, uh, and when you're putting, and you were working on putting this club together and getting them ready for that, um, I mean, what did that checklist look like from an independent perspective and making sure that you had the autonomy that you were wanting, um, that you were wanting while also understanding you're gonna be working within a structure still? What it looked like was coming up with a plan, coming up with a vision, coming up with a strategy. <laughs> what it looked like was not sleeping for months on end, <laughs> uh, realistically. And, you know, having full faith and confidence that when you did need help, that the league office was there to be helpful and not punitive. And I feel we have all of those things here in spades. Um, is it perfect? Of course, it's not perfect. We have we have absolutely killed ourselves to deliver on every one of our promises. And now that there's been a correction to our timeline, it's a tremendous challenge. That said, I can say I, I'm always picking up the phone and getting help and not the opposite. So for that, I'm extremely grateful um, and we'll just keep going and we'll make it work over time. Are you getting those kinds of questions as you're starting to um, look at potential clubs and partners and third party support for the women's league are those the same kind of questions you're seeing or hearing about what's our flexibility yeah absolutely and and i think that the reality for us it, it's still early with whistle and um it, everything is perfect in many ways before you start the day it becomes imperfect is the day you actually do start which <laughs> does very well you know and it's it, that is our it is our mutual reality um at this stage we're trying to be flexible in many things but again, we wanted to place cultural bumpers where there won't be necessarily flexibility. And you can count, you know, you can count. You have to interview qualified, at least two qualified candidates of women that are women or minorities for every position that opens on your team. And we're not necessarily talking on the field, but front office and the league office too. And that's, gonna, that's a hard thing in all likelihood to live with for some people in a practical way. And yet that's the places I think the league will have to be as, those are the bumpers. Mm -hmm. However, what is flexible is very, very wide. It's, you know, it's culture first, but again, we're looking for ownerships and trying to do that very, very consistently and sort of vet potential ownership groups that they are really on board with that, that that's not something that they're coming, kicking and screaming, but are excited about and those kinds of things. That's just one example. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, everybody, yeah, this is the, the land of entrepreneurs. And if you wanted to buy a McDonald's, you'd go buy a McDonald's. And if you wanted to open a, your own, you know, incredibly creative restaurant, you're not buying a franchise. We are incredibly creative restaurant owners, <laughs> writ large. <laughs>
and everybody's going to do their own thing and it's going to have its own flavor and it's going to be special and for that there's absolutely going to uh, you know we're early early days any last things about uh independent versus franchise that you want to bring up that we didn't touch upon uh, one more thing. I said uh, franchise model, uh, the franchise fee investment. I just want to end on this point. Invest it in your community. Um, the other thing that I would also suggest that we strive for uh, within Whistle mm -hmm. uh, and at NISA is to allow the teams to flourish in their own revenue streams and not, not piggyback off of those revenue streams. We're here mm -hmm. to, we put club That's over league. Point. And that's one of our North Stars. And so mm -hmm. we do, we, we vet the clubs in the beginning. We onboard them as best we can. We let them run. And when they need support, we're there to pick them up. Uh, or when they stub their toe, we're there for them. But at the end of the day, the best way we can support the club is by giving them the roadmap to be successful on their own and to let them retain their own revenue. No, that's that's the critical piece. You know, this is investment in your club. That money that would have gone to the league in a franchise system now comes towards your development in your community, in your club. And there is no better model from my perspective for that purpose. There just isn't.